This afternoon's session is called the Equine Welfare Roundtable, and the first of our speakers will be Dr. Scott Palmer. Dr. Scott Palmer is the New York State Gaming Commission's Equine Medical Director. And in that role, Dr. Palmer is responsible for all aspects of equine health, safety and welfare at New York racetracks, and advises the Commission on equine medication policies, as well as a large number of other tasks. Dr. Palmer also serves as an adjunct professor at Cornell University's College of Veterinary Medicine. And since graduating from Penn Vets School of Veterinary Medicine in 1976, Dr. Palmer has worked as a staff clinician at the renowned New Jersey Equine Clinic. Additionally, Dr. Palmer is board certified in the American Association of Veterinary Practitioners. He has served in a number of organizational roles, including the prestigious AAEP presidency, approximately 2009. And he served this organization over the years in a number of capacities. One, as a, a member of the RCI Special Task Force on Medications and a number of other medication committees. And with that, as a background, and it's brief because there's much more I could say, I'll welcome Dr. Palmer to the podium to speak about identifying the at-risk course. Thanks, Corinne, and thanks to the uh, ARCI for having me here to talk to you guys this afternoon about this. This is a topic that's very important to me, and, and I'm sure it's very important to all of you. And it's going to be a very brief talk, but the idea would be to give you some, a little bit of a background about what we're talking about, and then talk a little bit about some things that we're looking into in New York to help us do a better job of identifying horses at risk. So uh, we're going to talk about risk factors. And I'd like you to think, though, that in addition to risk factors, there are things called protective factors as well. As well. So a risk factor is something that increases the risk of injury, and a protective factor is something that decreases the risk of injury. And we don't often talk about protective factors, but when you look at the big picture, I think it's important to put that in context. There are some risk factors are kind of difficult to manage. They're just fixed risk factors. There's not much you can do about them. And while there are others that are modifiable, those are the ones that are most easily changeable. There are individual risk factors for the horse, and there are environmental risk factors that come into play as well. Some of these factors are more important than others, and, and it's really the combination of both a fixed and risk uh, risk factors and protective factors that really determine the ultimate risk of the overall likelihood of injury or death on the racetrack. Now, the interesting thing here is, though, even though there are some of these risk factors we consider to be fixed, I believe we can influence those fixed factors by modulating the, uh, the modifiable risk factors and the protective risk factors. So we can make a difference here. We don't just have to accept the risk and say that you just have to deal with it or you just have to live with it, rather, that these, these issues can be influenced to some degree, and the degree to which we can influence them uh, increases the level of risk aversion, and that's really the, the bottom line concept here is we want to, by all parties in racing, increase the level of risk aversion. I think that one of the first challenges we need to face is to educate people about risk factors and increase the level of awareness about risk factors and protective factors and what we can do about them. And I'd just like to illustrate this for you as an example. This would be what I would call the program perspective. For, it was a very well-known thoroughbred racehorse, a race in New York. Um, he had 41 career starts since five years of racing. He was on the board 17 in his last 18 races. Buyer figures were off the charts pretty much. He finished first in his last five races, a total earnings of almost a million dollars. So that's, that's the program perspective, so that when the trainer is looking at this horse, the owner is looking at this horse, the general public is looking at this horse, that's what they see. And that's how they, they would describe or, or characterize this horse. Now this is the way I would characterize this horse. You know, in addition to all those other things, he's, he's a, he's a seven-year-old horse. He, he, uh, is, he fits into the category of being three years old or older. He never races a two-year-old. That's a big one. 41 and a half high-speed furlongs within two months of his final race. Five races and 22 races. He had pre, a lot of pre-existing injury in his fetlock joints. And this horse went out and broke his leg in his next race. You know, so this is a great example of a horse. If you owned this horse or if you trained this horse, if he looked good and he was acting well, why in the world wouldn't you race him? You know, he was an ATM machine. But the actual fact of the matter is, through a totally different lens, he's a very scary horse. And so I think that just one of the big challenges we have in front of us right now is increasing through continuing education the level of understanding and appreciation for these risk factors in a, in a different way of looking at the horse. There are enormous consequences to risk in racing. We have 
economic consequences nationally. Uh, the annual economic loss approaches the total amount of, of thoroughbred racing in the state of Florida, about a billion dollars. So it's an enormously expensive proposition with uh, loss to the industry. industry. Human lives are certainly at stake. Um, not Fortunately, not too many people die in the process of a horse breaking down, but it, it can happen. It certainly does happen. And the lives of the horses are really important as well. And this is a, a really enormous emotional and public relations problem for our industry, far beyond the economic thing. So these are just some points about why we really need to take this very seriously. The Equine Injury Database, Mary Scalay uh, had a huge part in getting this thing started. has been really, really helpful for us. With over 2 million starts in the database now, there's so much information there that's statistically valid and helps us to identify uh, characteristics of horses and their exercise profiles uh, that help us identify horses at risk. Uh, the fetlock joint is an area of particular concern. You know, a very, very large percentage. That number varies a little bit from, from region to region, but it's a very, very high percentage of all the fatalities related to breakdowns of the fetlock joint. If you look at the national perspective from the Equine Injury Database over the last uh, six years, the number of fatalities has remained fairly constant. There's a fairly small amount of change there, but a slight decline perhaps. If you look at it from a, a regional standpoint, uh, when you look at these are the Naira fatalities in the same time period, you can see there's some similarities and some differences over the last few years. If you look at local factors, there can be local risk factors in play that can mean that the risk of injury at different racetracks can be different. So the risk factors are not one size fits all. They really are important to understand that they can be national factors, they can be regional factors, and they can be local factors that come into play when you're thinking about this. So what are the chances of a horse getting injured on the racetrack? Well, that's an interesting question, and there really is no place to go for this information. So I talked to Noah Cohen about it, who's an epidemiologist at Texas A&M University. And we knocked this around a little bit and decided, well, we look at a foal crop that had already run its lifetime out. These are 1995 foals, averaged about 20 starts in their lifetime. And they, at the same time, the national uh, fatality rate is about 0.2%. So that works out to be about a 4% chance of any horse, any thoroughbred race horse, goes into the starting gate, is about a 4% chance of having a catastrophic injury during that race. And that's not a big number, of course, unless you're one of the 4%. But, but it just points out that there is, there is some baseline level of risk that's involved in the sport. Just as, as though if we go out to drive our automobiles, you know, there's a baseline level of risk of us going out on the highway. I would wager that none of us in this room are going to be in an automobile accident in the next 15 minutes. It's not, not I just don't think it's just possible. But if we were out there on the highway, it'd be a whole different story. So again, risk is a very modifiable thing, but that's the baseline is about 4%. Dr. Parkin came up with this number. I think it's fascinating. 50% of the catastrophic fractures occurred in 25% of the high risk horses. So what does this mean? Well, this means that risk is not uniformly distributed amongst the population. That 4% number is fine as a baseline number, but all horses are not the same. They are different levels of risk, and part of our job is to figure out why and how. How do we define that? How do we identify those horses? Interestingly, I think risk factors are, are, are complex, problematic issues because it's, horses can go out with a very low risk factor level, a very low load of risk, and still have a catastrophic injury. And older horses with a tremendous bibliography of risk factors can go out there and race safely. You know, there's no one thing that defines these things. So that the, the, the challenge that we confront as a trainer can be racing a horse like the horse I showed you earlier, that seven-year-old gelding. He raced many, many, many times with the same risk factors and was just totally fine. So how do you tell that trainer, now is the time to stop? Now is the time to, to hang this horse up, retire him, we'll have a nice lunch for you, you know, with the chairman of the racetrack, big retirement ceremony. How do you convince him that now is the time to do that? So it's, again, that's another challenge of trying to figure out when you do that. But uh, the risk factors alone are not a standalone deal. We cannot just, we would be scratching. This, this paper is a great paper. It was done in Kentucky many years ago, 1999. And in this paper, they, they realized that if they had scratched every horse they thought was going to have a problem, they would have scratched about 65% of the horses that were running. Now, that's just not a sustainable deal. You, know, you just can't do that. So we have to be more discriminating somehow. Uh, the task force that I worked with, with Mary and Alan and, and Jerry a few years ago, we looked at risk factors and thought it was an important thing to just look at those fatalities at Aqueduct and figure out, well, how many of those horses had risk factors that we thought were important? And they did. They had some in a range of eight risk factors that we're using. We used Dr. Parkin's risk factor menu at that point, and they averaged about 5.5 um, between, you know, on a scale of, of 1 to 8. 
or zero to eight. So again, they were up there a little bit. But the one thing we did not do was we did not look at all the horses in the race. These were the these were the risk factors in the dead horses. We did not look at all the horses that didn't have an injury. And Mary, and uh, Lisa and Al up at their Finger Lakes has done this, and she's done a terrific job of this. She says this, this is great. She says it's not anything special. She says I make a spreadsheet. I look at horses and I identify high risk clusters. That's a really special thing. She says it's not. She's a very self depreciating woman. Very very good veterinarian. And she's she has really got a good handle on this. Here, if you look at these are eleven horses in a race, and these are these are Tim Parkins risk factors here. And at the bottom of there, you can see the total of all the risk factors. You can see there's a range of, of between five and eight in the risk factors. Now, one of these horses died in the race. Okay, it was this one. Had a risk, total risk factor of seven, not the highest. Horse number seven had an eight. There were two other sevens in the race. They didn't die. But my point is that, that if you look at this, that doesn't mean that those sevens of that eight didn't have a challenge down the road in the next race or the race after that. So I, I think it's 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 really disingenuous to dismiss a horse that gets out of a race with a high risk factor value just because he didn't die in the race. That's a really important concept that we have to emphasize. This is a great quote. All training exercise involves a balance between the risk of fracture, essentially inherent with loading, and the beneficial effect that loading has by stimulating bone cells to produce a more robust architecture. Most of these horses get in trouble because they have changes going on in their bones where there is a process called bone remodeling or bone resorption is a piece of that where calcium is actually being taken away or cells are being removed, removing bone to create new bone. So you have this remodeling process where you have the, the one on one side, you have the osteoclast, those are the construction workers that are doing the demolition. And then you have the osteoblast, those are the, the new construction going on. And that gets out of balance. And if you don't have enough time to provide rest for that horse, you add the stress along to it, it creates a really, really serious problem. So that's the real core issue that we're looking at. And so again, how do we figure that out? How do we, how do we document or measure that and figure out what's going on in these horses' legs to help us see how much risk they're really at? High-speed furlongs is something that I find very interesting. We're doing some research on that right now. But this was a, an interesting paper out of California that showed that if a horse in, in a two-month period of time had 35 high-speed furlongs, that's, that includes time breezes and racing, basically, compared with 25 furlongs, they, they were almost four times as likely to have a catastrophic injury. That's a big number. Four times the risk is a number that I'm not comfortable with. And I'm sure none of you in this room would be comfortable increasing your risk of any kind of an injury four times. So that's something that we're looking at, and I think that's an important piece of the puzzle. Um, this is a quote back in 1996, quite a long time ago actually. Uh, this is in a human journal. It said it would seem the development of stress fractures results from unsuccessful adaptation of bone to change its mechanical environment caused by repetitive loading. And they talk about this imbalance that I referred to a minute ago. This is really the core concept there. This is the thing that we need to learn how to do really well. And there's some trainers that can do this better than others. There's some trainers that are very aware of this and do a very good job of incorporating rest into their training programs. The other trainers, not so much. So I think this is a really a great, great opportunity for a modifiable risk factor that we can impact greatly. But it's going to take some education to get people on board with this and to help them understand how to make it work. I mentioned to you earlier that fetlocks are the real, the core problem here. If we could get rid of fetlock breakdown injuries, we could reduce our injury rate phenomenally. It would really change the whole landscape. Now, I don't suppose that's realistic if they can get rid of all of them, but why don't we take a look at that and see what we can do to get rid of some of them. Proxima says bone well, fractures come in a wide range of shapes and forms. The one on the far right is the one that is particularly devastating, of course. That's a biaxial proxima says bone well, fracture. There is no fixing that fracture. You can fetlock, you can arthrodesize that fetlock, and sometimes that works with a salvage procedure, and many times not so. But it's, it's an absolutely devastating injury, and it's one that, that we're looking at in terms of doing some research right now in terms of what are the epidemiologic factors that lead the horse down that road, and can we identify them before they get there. This is a great, another great paper out of California that looked at proximal sesamoid bones and demonstrated very convincingly, this is a, a, a bone with a mid-body fracture here, but if you look over here at this slide, this is a microradiograph where you can see some bone sclerosis here and some bone sclerosis here, and this is the normal trabecular pattern in the middle. And what this paper showed us is that you can have changes in these bones that will predispose them to fracture. So if we look at the next slide, you can see that these are some microradiographic changes with some stress fractures right in here, right along here. Here's some remodeling of the, the bone canals in here and over in here the same. So these are changes, microscopic changes in the bone that are present while the horse is out there training and racing. And at some point, that serves like the dotted lines on a paper towel rack, you know, and, you, and, it, and it forms a, a point where the bone will break. These are some very interesting pictures that are, as well, if you look at the top row, these are all horses that had uh, 
mid-body sesamoid fractures. And if you look down here, there's something similar going on here, right? You can see the bone is really dense back in this area, long here and long here. And you can see small cracks along here. Well, guess what? These bones were on the opposite leg of the one that broke. So in other words, these were the bones that broke. Let's say it's the left. The exact same thing was happening in the right, but just not quite as bad. So we can look in a necropsy program, if the, if the one leg is totally shattered and we can't really get a good look at it, we can look at the other leg with our necropsy program and make a really good determination about what's going on in those bones before the accident happened. Very important piece to understand as well. <coughs> So what are we thinking about doing in New York? Well, we're, we're trying to, again, to step up, to take it to another level, to step up the screening process so we can identify these horses at risk. And we're using a combination of things. I was talking to Tim Parkin at the AP meeting in December in Salt Lake City this past year. And I asked him, I said, Tim, how are we coming with this risk factor deal? I mean, we have lots of new risk factors. We've got eight of them that he developed. There's a list of about 23, 24 that I've been looking at from a research standpoint. Some of them are more uh, easy to apply than others. But my point is this. How, how good, if we used 25, if we used 100 risk factors, would that be any better than using eight risk factors? Could we, could we more accurately discriminate the horses that are going to get hurt if we use more risk factors? And he said, we're about at 65% right now. He said, we, we have about a 65% degree of accuracy to predict or predictability to predict a horse being injured. Well, 65 is not that great because, again, that's 35% that, you know, we would get wrong. Okay, we have false positives. That means that the test is not very sensitive or specific, rather. So the point being, we need to do better. Well, how are we going to do that? We need, we need to get more information because we've, we've nearly exhausted what we can gather from the equine injury database in its present form. So how can we do better? Well, we, need, we can do better if we had a little more different information from different sources. So let's look a little bit of this. So if we look at the epidemiology, the epidemiology is something that um, is, is very good for the um, Equine entry database gets a ton of data in there for us to work with, but we don't really have a ready, a really ready available means to take that data of two million horses, okay, two million starts rather, and how do we get the, the gems out of there? There's good information there, but how do we get it out? Not only how do we get it out, that's the research end, but how do we make it user friendly so anybody can use it? Lisa Hanal stays up late at night and works on her spreadsheets. Lisa Hanal stays up in the, after, or in the afternoon between races working on her spreadsheets, okay? Lisa Hanal loves spreadsheets, and she's really good at it. How many of you in this room love spreadsheets and are really good at it? I'm sure there's some of you. I'm not one of them. But, and, and a lot of examining veterans are not as good as Lisa is at. So Lisa does a super, super job of this, and her injury rate at Finger Lakes in the past year was better than any other track in New York. Now, maybe there's other factors in play as well, but give her, I give her a lot of credit. So we need to find a way to take Lisa's technology and simplify it and make it really easy so we can put it in everybody's hands so everybody can use it without a lot of trouble. Because it takes about, by hand, it takes me almost two hours to take a single horse and chart all the risk factors and chart the whole exercise history. And thanks to the Jockey Club and a fellow named Brad Kimbrell, who runs in, who is the president of Encompass, we're working on software to make reports that will make this really, really easy for everybody. And so it'll take seconds. You know, you'll be able to go in there and put in the track, the race, and get a list of these horses, and you'll know the risk factors. And that's the direction we're heading. But, but that's really, really important that we make it easy to use. So the first segment of this in New York is to use epidemiology to try and identify these horses, what's unique about them. Second, then we're going to make a computer script that will enable us to look at large numbers of data. A whole race card, for example. When the proofs come out three days out of the race, we can take that list of horses and generate this document put it in the hands of the examining veterinarians, and they'll know the risk profiles of every horse in the cart. That's where we're going, and that's a wonderful opportunity, really. So then, and we also uh, need to use this information to help identify candidates for what we call multi-modal multi screening. Now, that's a project that Alan Nixon's working on, and this is an idea, his idea is to look at the, the, basically the ability of standing MRI to detect these injuries before they happen, the predisposing factors, compare that with scintigraphy and see if one's better than the other for that, and then develop a statistical paradigm to enhance the sensitivity of this whole model so we can have fewer false negatives and be more accurate in our diagnosis. So looking at bone markers, this has been around for a really long time. Uh, Wayne McElwraith first started looking at this about almost 10 years ago. I would talk to Wayne every year at the AP and he'd say, Wayne, where are we with the bone markers? Are we close? Absolutely, within one year, two at the most. Uh, every year, I just get the same answer. So it's a, it's a challenge. These are not really easy things to do. I can tell you that. But, but this one, this um, osteocalcin is a bone marker that, that is used to evaluate bone turnover. It has to do with bone resorption, sorry. 
the bone resorption is the first thing we talked about um, in terms of the osteoclast. So this is a marker for bone resorption. Okay. The next marker he's looking at is, is a type 1 collagen carboxyl terminal telepeptide. And that one is another model for bone resorption. So another bone model marker for that. And then finally, there's another one, the serum a P PINP, which looks at uh, increased bone formation. So we have three different bone markers. Two of them look at resorption. One of them looks at bone being deposited. And increased levels of these, these blood markers will tell us if a horse has got something going on there in terms of active bone remodeling. And so, again, this is early in the research stage of things, but those things can be very helpful too. Now, let's say that we, 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 we use the epidemiology. We've got a list of, of 5,000 horses at Belmont Racetrack in a season, and we know the risk profile of every one of them. Maybe 200 of the 5,000 ring the bell for epidemiologic concern. They look scary in terms of the number of high-speed furlongs, in terms of the number of races, in terms of this or that. So that's we've narrowed the list down from, say, thousands down to hundreds. So maybe we take a list of hundreds and we contact the owners privately or the trainers privately. This is not something that we want in the newspaper, but you contact these people as a medical consultant would say, you know what, your horse has got some interesting profile issues coming on here we found with the epidemiology. Maybe we ought to get some bone markers on this horse. So we draw the blood and the horse is totally normal. Well, that gives you a sense that maybe, okay, well, things are pretty quiet right now, so it's not quite the same level of risk as if his bone markers are elevated. If the bone markers are elevated, it puts them in a whole different category. Maybe now we need to be a little bit more concerned and then maybe now we go to the MRI. Now the MRI is expensive. The MRI is, is the standing MRIs are, are, are practical out there. They're useful at this kind of thing. These are images from a, a paper Dr. Peloso published this past this year, and these are great, great MRI images. The reason why they're so great is that's a dead leg. There's no motion there. It's a little harder to get a great quality MRI in a standing horse with this type of technology, but. They're pretty good. So these, what he's showing us here is he's been able to grade. These are proximal sesamoid bones, cross, cross section here. This is the cannon bone here. And what he's showing here are, is a grade of normal. Densification grade is the grade two, and then grade three is extreme densification. Densification just means how dense is the bone. In radiology, we use the term sclerosis, the MRI folks. Don't like that term, they call it densification. So it's a term you may not be familiar with, it just means how solid, how dense, how brittle is that bone. So anyway, this is a, a, three, a grade three system, three graded system for the sesamoids, and he's got a five grade system for, the, this is again, like a different view of the sesamoids, he's got a five grade view of the bottom of the cannon bone. So it's not important that you know all the details there, but the idea is that he's developed a grading system to look at sesamoids and cannon bones and rate them in terms of how densified they are and how high a risk maybe for subsequent injury. So that's pretty interesting. Well, now the, the next step, step, of course, is well, how do we go from the, is this working live horses? We've got the dead horse study here. Well, what about live horses? Well, this is interesting. This is a case study that John just sent me recently. This is a, a three-year-old thoroughbred race horse training at Palmetto's racetrack. And on, on January 19th, he trained great, had a great uh, five, eight, uh, five for a long race, came out a little bit sore, great two out of five lane, jogging on the pavement. Looked at the horse, his ankle looked fine, there was nothing you could really see wrong with it. Slightly painful deflection, they radiographed it, and these were the radiographs. These are two different views of the of this ankle. Um, on the left is a regular dorsal palmer view, and the right is a view where it's a little bit of a dang angle shot. We get a little bit better look at the bottom of the cannon bone, and they're normal. So radiographs are normal. Of course, a little bit sore. They backed off them a little bit, put them back in training again. Well, I didn't like the way this horse came out of another breeze, and the horse um, was actually entered the race that Saturday. And so the trainer, though, said, you know, I just don't like the way this looks at it. Let's, let's let Dr. Peloso look at it with his MRI deal. So we did that. And what did he find here? These are areas that indicate um, edema in the bone in a linear pattern at the lateral, along the lateral condyle. It's called the lateral parasagittal ridge. And this is a condyle fracture waiting to happen. Okay, this is a crack in the bone. These are microfractures in the bone with edema or swelling around it going right up where the condyle fracture is going to go. That's the view from the front. That's the view from the side. So here was a great case where Dr. Pulis was able to say to this trainer, he would have broken his leg that, in that race on Saturday if you hadn't stopped and checked with him today. And absolutely certainty about that. So anyway, that's a really neat demonstration. This is a live horse. And you'll notice the quality of these images is not quite as great as the quality in the study with the dead horse, but they're good enough. That's the point. They're good enough in a scanning sense to be able to identify some of these things. 
And then finally, this is another example of using an MRI. This is a different horse with a condyle problem. There's, again, a, a lesion over here. This is not going to predispose to a condyle fracture per se, but that's subchondral bone necrosis and bone edema. It's a problem. It's a lameness issue, which can lead to catastrophic injury. But uh, this is a horse that they discovered it with the MRI. They started monitoring this horse. And over a four-month period, you can see how this got smaller and smaller and smaller and to the point where they can make recommendations about this horse is ready to go back into training safely without that kind of injury being present. So again, it's just a quick look at some MRI technology that can be really helpful for us and how we can maybe use that in conjunction with epidemiology and in conjunction with bone markers. And I just wanted to share this with you. This is just my feeling about future directions in which we need to go to really, really do a great job of identifying horses at risk. We need a couple of things. We need to educate people. We need to educate people about risk factors and protective factors and help them understand the importance of them and how to find them. Where do I go and find these things? And how do I use them? How do I set up a chart for this like Lisa does? And we also need to increase the participation of trainers and practicing veterinarians. These guys know what's going on better than I ever will or any regulator ever will because they're seeing the horse every day. And so they know if there's a little inflammation in the leg. They know if they've been with some fennel butas on their train. They know what's going on with that horse so much better than I ever will. So really, they are the best people to do the risk factor analysis because they know the truth. They know exactly what's going on. They can put all the pieces together. And with that information, they can do a better job of deciding whether this horse is a good idea to run or not. <coughs> I think from a regulatory standpoint, there's an opportunity to increase the technology to use to improve our sensitivity of the pre-race inspections. If you look over a long period of time, if you look at all the pre-race inspections of these horses that, that are dying a race, they don't change much. In other words, they'll have the same findings for six months up to a year, maybe even more than a year. Slightly enlarged ankles, slight this, slight that, oscillate here, suspensory there. But nothing definitive. The ankle's not swollen, it's not sore. When they flex them, he's okay. They go out and they still break their leg. The reason is that it's very difficult, it's really mission impossible for an examining veterinarian to accurately diagnose subchondral bone edema. He can't do it. He can never diagnose the things that we can see in this MRI. He just can't do it with his hand. It's impossible or she. So we need to, to make that a little bit more specific. And there's some inertial motion sensor technology that's really fascinating. I used it a lot when I was in practice to diagnose lameness. I think incorporating that technology in our pre-race inspections would be a phenomenal upgrade of the process. A little time consuming. It takes a, pre, a normal pre-race pre exam takes a few minutes to do. Inertial motion exam might take five or six. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but it can be if you're looking at 100 horses in a day. So it may be, mean more veterinarians, maybe more technology. That this is, These are things that can be addressed. But if we could document what's going on and discriminate better in the pre-race exam, we would do a lot better job of figuring out what horses are likely to get hurt. And then finally, to employ the epidemiology and advanced imaging technology to really bear down on horses that are at extreme risk and intervene and do something about it. So that's, that's where I'm headed with all this. And thanks, Corinne.